that there are two small pieces of double stick tape between intimate cabaret and another sort of intimate cabaret. Hello, everyone. What a pleasure to be here. I'm Melissa Erica, and we're here to sing our record, Sondheim Sublime. Thank you for coming. It's quite surreal to be here. I've been singing here since my early 20s, and uh, I was invited out here when I was in My Fair Lady ages ago. I remember the days of sharing my dressing room with people like Kitty Carlisle. I remember, um, I was just telling you this, and it's not supposed to be in the show, but Lauren Bacall coming to my room when I was really young and saying, darling, you're gonna be a star. What you need is a scandal. <laughs> we may be up on that now. Um, so if you don't know who Stephen Sondheim is, you can leave now. <laughs> don't worry, the doors are locked. It was very kind of uh, Guildhall to tweet so much and make such a fuss um, about this. It's been, for people who have known me and grown up with me, this has been uh, an amazing year um, to have this album be so uh, welcomed and, and, and appreciated. Um, and I, I have uh, really had the greatest year of my life. Ted and I have been all around the world singing it and all around the country, and we have a busy summer doing it. But I owe uh, all the thanks in the world to uh, Mr. Ted Firth, who's on the album. I would say Ted is sort of my, my soulmate um, in music. Everything he does is something extraordinary to me. Um, so tonight we're gonna do what rock stars do. We're gonna sing down the record. Um, that, that's an expression in rock, I heard. Um, <laughs> that's all I know about rock and roll. So we're gonna sing the album. Um, I don't think we're skipping any of them. And we're gonna sing it through for you to hear the album. I've done a lot of Sondheim uh, music and a lot of Sondheim concerts where I do this and that, but I wanted to share with you why I made this album and what I was thinking. Um, I've worked with Mr. Sondheim a few times. I've done a few musicals with him. But I came, I came upon a moment in my life where I thought, what have I been learning? in the theater? What am I getting out of all this? What is it to be an actress? And if I had to grab a few songs that, would, that I would leave as a letter to you, to my peers, to my children, to anyone, what have, what have I learned and what have I felt deeply? And I really came back to Stephen Sondheim's music, really speaks to me and it, there's something that I believe philosophical that you can really live by. Now this is a very interesting thing about Mr. Sondheim's music is that for example, the last song I just sang, it is sung, it is from a, a does anyone know where it's from? It's like it's the Evening Primrose, right? Okay, so we all know everything, which is good. Um, it is a very obscure uh, television special called Evening Primrose. It was very obscure, plus it aired uh, in the 60s on the night of the great, one of the great blackouts. Um, so it was further obscured by, by electricity and so, but um, uh, it is, tells the story of a girl who is trapped in a department store and she has been there since she was six years old and as an adult she's still remembering, she's living with mannequins, it's all very strange and cult-like, um, just like this room. <laughs> She's in the department store and she hasn't seen the natural world, the sky, trees, so much as a leaf since she was a child. And so it's a very specific and obviously peculiar situation. And Mr. Sondheim writes for theater, for peculiar, specific situations. That's his vocation. Um, however, there's something about how specific it is and yet somehow, I don't think you need to know any of that to feel it. There's something so universal, a kind of mysterious quality that goes way beyond the specifics of theater and attaches us to our longings, to the way we try to recall our memories and restore our losses. So there's something so poetic in his music. So I was thinking about that side of Mr. Sondheim. And as I was an art history major in college, I studied a period in art called the sublime. And the sublime is a movement in uh, romantic English painting. Uh, I went to London recently with Ted to do this for the second time. We had a lovely run in London doing Sondheim. And I went to the, the Tate Britain and I went to the sublime museum, the whole wing of the Tate Britain, and saw the paintings of Turner. And I don't know if you're familiar with them, but they're amazing paintings in which um, uh, images are, are, were, were painted of great beauty, of nature, but the concept was beautiful things tinged and mixed with terror. 
the idea of, of a shipwreck, of storms, beautiful, beautiful things that are also tangled with, with, with horror and terror and darkness. And I thought to myself, beauty and terror, that's Sondheim. So I was, I was thinking to myself, now, you know, he's a Jewish intellectual, and I happen to know, a, happen to have a friend who's a, also a Jewish intellectual, and I said to my friend, I said, do you know anything else, or do you know anything about the sublime? And he says, well, it's funny, you should be, you should ask me, I was talking to my rabbi today. <laughs> and my rabbi was telling me about another rabbi from the 17th century who wrote a book about the sublime. And he was talking about it just today. And so, unlike any other nightclub act that you've been to this week, um, <laughs> I'd like to read for you a moment of uh, Talmudic scholarship from the 17th century. <laughs> this is Rebbe Zelman. We have two souls inside us, one for our duties and one for our desires. They war for the citadel of ourselves every day and night. When we manage to treat our duties as though they were desires, when what you want is what you ought to do. Well, he said, that's when we reach the sublime. Interesting, huh? You're all like, whoa. <laughs> uh, you just came from your barbecue, it's like your boat. Um, that magical moment where everything is working together, where, so how do we get there? And what is your duty and how do you balance it with your desires? And how do you make Feeling good, the same thing as being good. I believe Mr. Sondheim asks those questions over and over again, and all the characters in his plays struggle with that, until sometimes they're worn out by the revolutions. No more questions, please. No more tests. Comes the day you no more. We disappoint, we disappear, we die, but we don't. They disappoint in turn, I fear, forgive, though they won't. No more riddles, no more quests, no more curses you can't undo.
so nuanced to a girl, you know, I'm from Long Island, I'm a Catholic, an Italian girl, I was raised Catholic anyway, and I grew up in a world, you know, where we didn't ask these kind of questions. It was a sort of a yes-no uh, philosophy. <coughs> Mostly no. <laughs> so I grew up in Manhasset, for any of you Long Islanders, Manhasset is a... Uh, Manhasset's an old Indian name for Exit 36. <laughs> Um, and recently I was able to come back to my uh, almost hometown and I went to Patchogue and I did a production, um, a concert production, uh, with a wonderful Broadway orchestra with Alice Ripley of Into the Woods. And, um, you know, it's funny. You, you think you know these songs, that song was from Into the Woods, but I'd like to sing one more song for you from Into the Woods that was in that concert. And, um, that was in that show, of course. Um, but that is not on my album. But I think it, now, in retrospect, it should have been, or it's delightful that it's not, because it's sort of different in, 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 in music, but it's, it's, it's not different at all in the questions that it asks. I played the baker's wife. She is the uh, wife of the baker. <laughs> and, uh, and she has a moment uh, with, the, with Prince Charming. She wanted a baby the whole time, and she finally gets the baby, and in the second act, you know, she's got the baby, and so she gives the baby to Little Red Riding Hood. And, um, bumps into Prince Charming for the fourth or fifth time, and she's, uh, unable to resist. <laughs> In the woods, oh, 
It's a wink and a wiggle and a giggle in the grass and I'll trip the light fandango. A pinch and a dimple in the middle of a grass is why. It's a very short road from the pinch and the punch to the porch and the pouch and the pension. It's a very short road into the 10,000 clutch and the belch and the crouch and the sigh. In the meanwhile, there are mouths to be kissed before now.
Isn't it rich? Are we a pair? Me here at last on the ground, you in mid air. Send in. Oh. 
Thank you. 
Thank you. This album came about um, between me and Ted, but then there were a lot of emails with Mr. Sondheim in which I got some advice, he watched some videos, gave me a couple of song recommendations, and the next one is a song he, he requested. Um, and uh, he also gave me some chastisements. He said that self-deprecation is one of the worst qualities that anyone can possess, and he saw, thought that I possessed an ample amount of it. Um, so I've tried not to do that in this show. Um, he says that he is the champ, however. But that's interesting, and he always was throwing that kind of life advice across an email. And um, the last musical that I did was called, with that he was the composer of, oh no, well, that he was involved with, was uh, Do I Hear a Waltz at City Center. Thank you. A wonderful, interesting show. I mean, he hated writing it. It was his least favorite. Um, he, was, he wrote it with Richard Rogers, and uh, they had a miserable time together. Um, that's well known. Um, but I was doing the invited dress rehearsal at City Center, and the way a dress rehearsal at City Center works is they invite 1,100 people to the theater to come and see the show. And um, when I was done, I went off stage, and I went to the props table, and I was taking, dealing with my shoes and my purse and things like that, and uh, there was an announcement, would the cast and crew please come to the stage? So I came out uh, to the stage, and it was packed with people. There were all these backs. It was like Balanchine had come, and it was ABT or something, was, uh, not ABT, um, New York City Ballet, and I, I couldn't get there, so I climbed up to the top of the balcony, my character was balcony in Venice, and I saw that profile, and Mr. Sondheim was there, and everybody, you know, can't breathe, and I thought, Melissa, you know, relax, you know him, you've worked with him before, so I bent over the little balcony, and I went, hello, and he turned around, and he said, oh, you were, you were marvelous, most of the time. <laughs> and you see what he did there? It's the same thing I've been talking about. He says one thing, and then he disqualifies it. You feel one emotion, and then you feel the opposite. You feel something, and you're unsure of it. It's that bittersweet comma. And his whole face is like that. It's always turned into a comma, where he's reflecting on his emotions the minute he has them. That's what makes him so fascinating. So I hope I've given you some feel of that. So the song he recommended that I sing has another kind of punctuation. It's called, Isn't He Something? And when I was pu uh, having the, the uh, CD printed, somebody double-checked it, and it isn't, Isn't He Something? Question mark. It's, Isn't He Something? And it's from Roadshow. Now, Roadshow, like many um, musicals, uh, there's so many musicals out there. You know, the history of Broadway musicals is like the history of... Jewish men yelling at each other. <laughs> Roadshow, bounce, help me, bounce, gold, something else. Wise it's a, guys. wise guys, thank you. Um, it's one of those shows he frustrated him for 40 years. And so he loves the, the show. It's actually coming back to City Center this uh, summer with my friend Raul Esparza, with, with whom I did Sunday in the Park with George. But Roadshow is about the Meisner brothers. It's about the good song and the bad song. And Mr. Sondheim recommended I sing this next song. It is sung by the mother to the good son about how much she prefers and admires the bad son. <laughs> Seldom comes to see me, hardly ever calls. When he sends me letters, they're just two lines wrong.
Let me give to you something in return. I would be so pleased. And the to Josh Gladstone for having me so many years, so many decades at this point. And um, Sebastian and Raphael and Antonio and Patrick, all of that crew and, and for me today. You get to know me, you get to know what the sublime idea was. And, um, and thank you for coming and giving me the opportunity to sing and keep singing. Um, it means an infinite amount to me. Thank you. occasionally with Mr. Sondheim, but I email with people who email with Mr. Sondheim. And I was emailing with someone who was emailing him and who knows him quite well. And I told him a little bit about my ideas about duty and desire. And he said, oh, well, that's exactly it. That's exactly it. And he said, Steve had said to him, there is no contradiction in contradiction. That's mother's milk to me. <laughs> that's a quote. Um, so, in honor of the idea of saying goodbye his way, I will sing a song for you from a movie, um, and then another one, we sort of put them together as a medley. And in typical fashion, it's called Goodbye, comma, for now. <laughs>
so little to be sure of. If there's struggle within us and the struggle among us. 
we can all coexist. And they're in that image of the island of the Grand Jacques, I think, is something that can sustain us, this idea of coexistence. We don't all have to get along, but we have to live together. This is a song from Sunday in the Park with George. This is Dot's hat from the production. I like stealing things from each show. <laughs> it is sung by George Surratt's great-grandmother. And she's looking at the great painting, and the painting is around her in many, in many uh, sort of uh, modern projections. And she's talking to a young artist, also named George, who's stuck. And she knows so much about the history of his family and the history of moving on.
Just wait till we're 